Here's the single line diagram for the F-35 relay. A quick comparison of the two diagrams summarizes the differences between the two relays. The F-60 has many more protective elements than the F-35, but is designed to protect a single feeder. The F-35, on the other hand, may not support all the protective elements that are supported by the F-60, but can support up to six feeders. If the elements supported by the F-35 were sufficient to protect a given group of feeders, the F-35 would be a more economical solution than six separate F-60s. The horizontal case has room for six slot modules. Up to three CT-VT modules may be used, with eight inputs per module for a total of 24 CT-VT inputs. Up to six status modules with 16 contact inputs per module allows for up to 96 binary status inputs. Up to six control modules with eight outputs per module allows for up to 48 control contact outputs. And finally, up to six analog modules with eight rows per module allows for up to 48 analog transducer IOs. The vertical case has room for four slot modules. Up to three CTVT modules may be used, with eight inputs per module for a total of 24 CTVT inputs. Up to four status modules with 16 contact inputs per module allows for up to 64 binary status inputs. Up to four control modules with eight outputs per module allows for up to 32 control contact outputs. And finally, up to four analog modules with eight rows per module allows for up to 32 analog transducer IOs. The universal relay follows a terminal number assignment convention, which is three characters long, assigned in order by module slot position, row number, and column letter. Slot B and D are reserved for the power supply and CPU module respectively, and are only two columns wide and eight rows in height. All I.O. modules are three columns wide by eight rows in height. A U.R. wiring example is shown here. The power supply module provides power to the relay and supplies power for dry contact input connections. This diagram depicts the power supply wiring. The power supply module of the relay is designed for two voltage ranges. As specified in the UR manual, each range has a dedicated input for proper operation. Note that 14-gauge stranded wire with suitable disconnect devices is recommended. The power supply module provides 48 VDC power for dry contact input connections and a critical failure relay. The critical failure relay is a Form C that will be energized once control power is applied and the relay has successfully booted up with no critical self-test failures. If any of the ongoing self-test features detect a critical failure or control power is lost, the relay will de-energize. We will now demonstrate how to wire a DSP module that has both current and voltage inputs to the power system. If you require more information on the DSP module, please see the DSP movie in the Hardware Module section of this learning CD. We will first describe how to wire the voltage inputs to the power system. You will remember from the DSP module movie that the voltage inputs are found on the bottom half of the DSP. Each row of inputs will be used for one phase of voltage from the power system. Therefore, row number 5 will always be used for measuring phase A voltage, row number 6 for phase B voltage, and row number 7 for phase C voltage. The eighth row will be used for measuring the voltage on the opposite side of a breaker for synchro checking comparisons. The DSP voltage inputs can be wired to the power system in both delta and Y configurations. When wiring voltages in a Y configuration, the polarity side of each VT is connected directly to the phase inputs, and the non-polarity sides of the VTs are all connected together, and then tied to ground. We will now make the proper connections to wire the VTs in a Y configuration. On the primary side of the VTs, sometimes referred to as PTs, as in potential transformers, the polarity side of the VTs should be connected to one of the phases of the power system. The non-polarity side of each VT should then be connected together and then tied to ground. 
On the secondary side of the VTs, the polarity side of the transformer should be connected to column A of that row on the terminal block. The non-polarity side of all VT secondaries should all be connected to column C of that row on the terminal block and then tied together and then connected to ground. When wiring voltages in a delta configuration, there is no ground connection and the polarity side of each VT is connected to a non-polarity side of another phase. As seen here, the polarity side of phase A is connected to the non-polarity side of phase C. The polarity of phase C is connected to the non-polarity side of phase B. And the polarity side of phase B is connected to the non-polarity side of phase A. The connections required for connecting your VTs in a delta configuration are made in the following format. On the primary side of the VTs, the polarity of one VT should be connected to phase A of the power system. The non-polarity side of that VT should be connected to phase B of the power system. For the second VT, the polarity side is connected to phase C of the power system, and the non-polarity side is then connected to phase B of the power system. This is known as an open delta connection because it does not use a third VT for measuring voltage. On the secondary side of the VTs, we need to connect the polarity of the first VT to the polarity side of the phase A input, which is terminal 5A. Since in a delta connection the polarity side of phase A is connected to the non-polarity side of phase C, we need to attach a jumper to the non-polarity input of phase C, which is terminal 7C. Now take the polarity side of the second VT and connect that to the polarity side of the phase C input, which is terminal 7A. Since in a delta connection the polarity side of phase C is connected to the non-polarity side of phase B, we need to attach a jumper to the non-polarity input of phase B, which is terminal 6C. You will remember that on the primary side of the VTs, the non-polarity side of the transformers are connected to the same point on the power system, which is the phase B line. We also need to connect the non-polarities on the secondary side of the VTs together. This point is now connected to the polarity input of phase B on the DSP, which is terminal 6A. Since in a delta connection, the polarity side of phase B is connected to the non-polarity side of phase A, we need to attach a jumper to the non-polarity input of phase A, which is terminal 5C. To complete the VT connections, we need to attach the non-polarity side of these VTs to ground. For the current inputs, there is a separate row on the DSP used for each phase of current. If the CTs you are using have a 1 amp secondary, connect the polarity side of your CT to the column C input and the non-polarity side of the CT to the column B input. If the CTs you are using have a 5 amp secondary, connect the polarity side of your CT to the column A input and the non-polarity side of the CT to the column B input. Finally, all of the non-polarity sides of each CT should be connected together and then tied to ground. We will now show you two different methods of connecting the UR to measure ground currents. The first method we will show is known as the residual ground connection method. Take the wire that is connecting the non-polarity of the phase inputs to ground and connect it to column A or row 4. If we were using CTs with a 1 amp secondary, we would connect it to column C of row 4. Now take a wire and connect column B of row 4 to ground. This will complete the path for current to flow to ground. The next method available for measuring ground currents is through the use of a zero sequence CT. The zero sequence CT has each of the three phases passing through it. Any unbalance in the three phases will result in a residual current in the CT windings that can be measured by the relay. When connecting this CT to the DSP, connect the non-polarity side of the CT to column B of that row and the polarity side to the column that matches the secondary of the zero sequence CT. In our example, the zero sequence CT has a 5 amp secondary, therefore we will use column A. Relay phase CT should be chosen such that the FLA or FLC of the device falls within 50 to 100 percent of the CT primary rating. For example, if the FLA of the motor is 150 amps, 
a primary CT rating of 200, 250, or 300 is available. It would appear that the 200 amps is the best choice because it provides the greatest sensitivity and therefore better protection for the application. There are essentially two methods of determining if the CT is being driven into saturation. One is to use the CT secondary resistance, and the other method is to use the CT class. Using the CT secondary resistance, the first step is to calculate the burden, and the second step is to calculate the CT secondary voltage. The burden is calculated using the formula burden equals CT secondary resistance plus wire resistance plus relay burden resistance. Next, use this value to determine the CT secondary voltage where CT secondary voltage equals burden times current fault maximum divided by the CT ratio. Now, using the excitation curves for the given CT ratio, check to see that the knee voltage is at an acceptable value. The knee point is the point at which a 10% increase in voltage produces a 50% increase in magnetizing current. The second way to determine if the CT is being driven to saturation is to use the CT class. Again, you must first calculate the burden, this time using the formula burden equals wire resistance plus relay burden resistance and plug this value into the same CT secondary voltage formula. CT secondary voltage equals burden times current fault maximum divided by the CT ratio. The number in the CT class code refers to the guaranteed secondary voltage of the CT. From the given CT class, determine the amount of secondary voltage the CT can deliver to the load burden without exceeding the 10% ratio error. If a CT goes into saturation due to pure high symmetrical AC fault current, the CT will produce a distorted secondary current waveform, but the peak secondary current will still be ratio proportional to the peak primary current. DC CT saturation. At the time of fault, if a CT goes into saturation with a large DC component, the resultant secondary CT output current peak will be less than the CT ratio and in extreme cases can result in no secondary current output at all. Every digital input output module has a total of 24 terminal connections, three terminals per row with a total of eight rows. A given row of three terminals may be used for the outputs of one relay. For example, for form C relay outputs, the terminals connect to the normally open NO, normally closed NC, and common contacts of the relay. For a form A output, two of the terminals are used for the NO output, and the third is used for current detection for supervision features. Contact inputs are arranged in groups of four and use two rows of three terminals. Each input is individually optically isolated and grouped with four inputs using a single common. This allows each group of four outputs to be supplied by wet contacts from different voltage sources, if required, or a mix of wet and dry contacts. The table shown illustrates the 6B module and contact arrangement. Since an entire row is used for a single contact output, the name is assigned using the module slot position and row number. However, since there are two contact inputs per row, these names are assigned by module slot position, row number, and column position. A dry contact has one side connected to terminal B3B. This is the positive 48 VDC voltage rail supplied by the power supply module. The other side of the dry contact is connected to the required contact input terminal. Each contact input group has its own common terminal which must be connected to the DC negative terminal of the power supply module. When a dry contact closes, 
a current of 1 to 3 milliamps will flow through the associated circuit. A wet contact has one side connected to the positive terminal of an external DC power supply. The other side of this contact is connected to the required contact input terminal. In addition, the negative side of the external source must be connected to the relay common terminal of each contact input group. The maximum external source voltage for this arrangement is 300 volts DC. The voltage threshold at which each group of four contact inputs will detect a closed contact input is programmable as 16 volts DC for 24 volt sources, 30 volts DC for 48 volt sources, 80 volts DC for 110 to 125 volt sources, and 140 volts DC for 250 volt sources. The UR relay includes an active voltage monitor circuit connected across each Form A contact. In many applications, it is desired to monitor the breaker trip circuit integrity so problems can be detected before a trip operation is required. The circuit is considered to be healthy when the voltage monitor connected across the output contact detects a low level of current, well below the operating current of the breaker trip coil. If the circuit presents a high resistance, the trickle current will fall below the monitor threshold and an alarm would be declared. If it is required to monitor the trip circuit continuously, independent of the breaker position, that is open or closed, a method to maintain the monitoring current flow through the trip circuit when the breaker is open must be provided. This can be achieved by connecting a suitable resistor across the auxiliary contact in the trip circuit. The recommended resistances are shown in the table. I'll reiterate this concept. Form A has the capability of monitoring trip circuit voltage when the contact is open and the capability of monitoring current through the contact when it is closed. The relay will generate a digital signal which indicates the voltage has dropped below the 80-100 milliamp range. This bit can be used to seal in the coil to ensure it does not de-energize prematurely and burn its contacts due to the back EMF or the trip or close coils. See your manual technical specifications for Form A. iRig B is a standard timecode format that allows stamping of events to be synchronized among connected devices within one millisecond. The universal relay supports either DC level shifted or amplitude modulated. Third party equipment is available for generating the iRig B signal. This equipment may use a GPS satellite system to obtain the time reference so that devices at different geographic locations can also be synchronized. 